we're continuing our look at the original language words behind Godhead in the King James Bible. A lot of the legwork was done in the first video, so these next two will be a little bit shorter. In Romans 1, we have a very similar Greek word that is translated as Godhead, thiates. Edag defines it as the quality or characteristics pertaining to deity, divinity, divine nature, divineness. Again, these are all the entries, but we'll only look at a couple of them. It says first to see the preceding entry of a divinity. The term in such description is not tautologous, but usually refers to performance that one might properly associate with the divinity. First, we have Lucian, Calumnies 17. Alexander was delighted and ended by believing in it all. It gratified his vanity to think that he was now not only a god's son, but a god-maker. It would be interesting to know how many of his friends in those days found that what the new divinity did for them was to supply a charge of irreverence on which they might be dismissed and deprived of the king's favor. It's mentioned of Artemis, who made Ephesus famous through manifestations of her power. In the Ocarincus Papyri, 1381, we have... Uh, manifestations of healing. From the Apocrypha, Wisdom 18.9, For holy children of good men offered sacrifice in secret, and with one consent they took upon themselves the covenant of the divine law, or in the margin, law of divineness. Brenton's translation of the Septuagint reads, For the righteous children of good men did sacrifice secretly, and with one consent made a holy law. In the Epistle of Aristeas 95, the deepest silence prevails so that one would suppose that there was not a single person in the place, although the ministers and attendants number some 700, not to mention the large multitude of those who bring their sacrifices to be offered. Everything is performed with reverence and in a manner worthy of the divine majesty. The marginal note for divine majesty is literally great divinity. Then we have of persons who stand in close relation to a divinity and of the Christian proclamation. In Book 3 of Theophilus's to Autolycus, this chapter 29, reads, These periods then, and all the above-mentioned facts being viewed collectively, one can see the antiquity of the prophetical writings and the divinity of our doctrine, that the doctrine is not recent, nor our tenets mythical and false, as some think, but very ancient and true. It also points us to Theotes in Colossians 2.9, which we'll be looking at next time and references some articles regarding the relationship between the two words, but that is beyond our current study. In his introduction to the Epistle to the Romans, Paul is beginning his argument regarding the universal nature of sin. He says the wrath of God is revealed against those who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because God has shown to them what may be known of himself. Now this is speaking of natural revelation, not special revelation, that is scripture, which is clear as we go on. From the creation of the world, the invisible things of God, here Paul notes them as God's eternal power and Godhead, are clearly seen. These are understood by man through God's creation, so that man is without excuse. Scripture here clearly says that God's eternal power and Godhead are invisible. We cannot see them with our eyes. But Scripture does say that the invisible things of him are clearly seen. How do we see that which is invisible? Paul says they are understood by the things that are made. The workman is known by his work. If someone asks you to show them power, how do you do so? Visibly, we can see a symbol of power, such as a scepter or a strong arm or armies, but we don't see the power itself. We can also see the effects of power. A single command and multitudes obey. A single word and well-being or destruction can come upon thousands. God's invisible eternal power is seen by creation, that is, through creation. Likewise, for his Godhead, we see the effects of it by creation. Now, while we're not able to see with our eyes, we are able to see things with our intellect or reason, our understanding, as Paul refers to in Ephesians 1.18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Now, what of Godhead here? First, it cannot be referring to Denlinger's doctrine because Scripture says the Godhead is invisible. Scripture says God's Godhead is revealed through the things that are made. In Thompson's book, he says that to understand God's being, you must be born again. In the preface to his book, Denlinger says you will need three things in order to understand this book, salvation, a King James Bible, and prayer. Denlinger and company say that salvation is a prerequisite to understanding the Godhead. Scripture says it is understood by the lost. Denlinger and company say that a King James Bible is required to understand the Godhead. Scripture says it is understood through creation. Second, 
The word here cannot be referring to God's essence taken in its entirety. Even with Scripture, we cannot comprehend God's essence, though we apprehend, as I've stated before. Knowing in truth doesn't necessitate exhaustive knowledge. I think it would be best to take Godhead as referring to God's divinity here. Now, what is it about God's divinity that we know through his creation? I'll give my thoughts and read a section from Charnock, which we excerpted before from Discourse 12, though I'm not dogmatic on understanding it in this way, though obviously the first two understandings that I gave have to be ruled out. Paul names two invisible eternal things, God's power and Godhead. In verse 21, he gives two things that man has not done, though he sees these, glorify God and be thankful. Though I don't want to make the two statements absolutely linked. First, man knows through natural revelation that there is a God who created all things and upholds all things by the word of his power. But man does not glorify God for this. The pagans who, in a sense, recognized this most clearly, did not give God the glory due to him, but imagined gods like man. Even Aristotle, who said, Thus too must we think of God, who in might is most powerful, in beauty most fair, in time immortal, in virtue supreme, for though he is invisible to all mortal nature, yet is he seen in his very works. For all that happens in the air, on the earth, and in the water may truly be said to be the work of God who possesses the universe. Even Aristotle was still a polytheist. Secondly, man is not thankful, and this would appear to be in reference to his knowledge of the effects of God's Godhead in creation. As I said before, if we take Godhead for God's essence, we run aground since there is much we only know of God through Scripture. We do not know that it is the Son of God who upholds all things by the word of his power, and that without him was nothing made that hath been made, except through Scripture. We speak of God as love, but we do not know the depth of the love of God, apart from the revelation of Jesus Christ and the gospel. In this is God's grace and mercy fully made known, and we only know of the person of Christ and the gospel in Scripture. But Scripture speaks of God who maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. What else is this but God's general goodness towards his creation? And the actions of the sun and the rain upon all creation are seen by all men. And do they thank the true God for this? Paul says they neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. I think it's very likely that what is meant here is that God's power in creating and upholding the universe and his goodness towards all his creation are what is known through creation, and instead of man glorifying God and thanking him, their imaginations became vain and their foolish hearts were darkened. Finally, we'll end with the passage from Charnock. Ta Agathon was one of the names the Platonists expressed him by, and good and God are almost the same words in our language. All is readily consented in the notion of his goodness, as in that of his deity. Whatsoever divisions or disputes there were among them in the other perfections of God, they all agreed in this without dispute, says Synesius. One calls him Venus in regard of his loveliness. Another calls him Eroita, love, as being the band which ties all things together. No perfection of the divine nature is more eminently, nor more speedily visible in the whole book of the creation than this. His greatness shines not in any part of it, where his goodness doth not as gloriously glister. Whatsoever is the instrument of his work as his power, whatsoever is the orderer of his work as his wisdom. Yet nothing can be adored as the motive of his work, but the goodness of his nature. This only could induce him to resolve to create. His wisdom then steps in to dispose the methods of what he resolved, and his power follows to execute what his wisdom hath disposed and his goodness designed. His power in making and his wisdom in ordering are subservient to his goodness. And this goodness, which is the end of the creation, is as visible to the eyes of men, as legible to the understanding of men, as his power in forming them and his wisdom in tuning them. And as the book of creation, so the records of its government must needs acquaint them with a great part of it, when they have often beheld him, stretching out his hand to supply the indignant, relieve the oppressed, and punish the oppressors, and give them in their distresses what might fill their hearts with food and gladness. It is this the Apostle means by his Godhead, which he links with his eternity and power, as clearly seen in the things that are made, as in a pure glass. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. The Godhead which comprehends the whole nature of God as discoverable to his creatures, 
was not known, yea, it was impossible to be known by the works of creation. There had been nothing then reserved to be manifested in Christ. But his goodness, which is properly meant there by his Godhead, was as clearly visible as his power. The apostle upbraids them with their unthankfulness and argues their inexcusableness because the arm of his power in creation made no due impression of fear upon their spirits, nor the beams of his goodness wrought in them sufficient sentiments of gratitude. Their not glorifying God was a contempt of the former, and their not being thankful was a slight of the latter. God is the object of honor as he is powerful, and the object of thankfulness properly as he is bountiful. All the idolatry of the heathens is a clear testimony of their common sentiment of the goodness of God, since the more eminently useful any person was in some advantageous invention for the benefit of mankind, they thought he merited a rank in the number of their deities. The Italians esteemed Pythagoras a god because he was philithropoietos. To be good and useful was an approximation to the divine nature. Hence it was that when the Lystrians saw a resemblance of the divine goodness in the charitable and miraculous cure of one of their crippled citizens, Presently they mistook Paul and Barnabas for gods, and inferred from thence their right to divine worship, inquiring into nothing else but the visible character of their goodness and usefulness to capacitate them for the honor of a sacrifice. Hence it was that they adored those creatures that were a common benefit as the sun and moon, which must be founded upon a pre-existent notion, not only of a being, but of the bounty and goodness of God, which was naturally implanted in them, and legible in all God's works. And the more beneficial anything was to them, and the more sensible advantages they received from it, the higher station they gave it in the rank of their idols, and bestowed upon it a more solemn worship, an absurd mistake to think everything that was sensibly good to them to be God, clothing himself in such a form to be adored by them. And upon this account the Egyptians worshipped God under the figure of an ox, and the East Indians in some parts of their country deify a heifer, intimating the goodness of God as their nourisher and preserver in giving them corn, whereof the ox is an instrument in serving for plowing and preparing the ground.